Uh, good morning and welcome to the 17th meeting of the Culture, Tourism, Europe and External Relations Committee in 2017. I'd like to remind members and the public to turn off mobile phones and any members using electronic devices to access committee papers during the meeting should be ensured that they are switched to silent. The only item of business today is an evidence session with the Committee of the Region's Conference of Presidents. I would like to welcome the President, uh, the first Vice President and members of the Conference of Presidents to Scotland and to the Committee. We are delighted to have you here and look forward to our discussions on the implications of Brexit uh, for Scotland. Before we do that and uh, make our uh, formal uh, statements, perhaps I'd like to introduce, um, uh, invite you to introduce yourselves and for the members of the committee to introduce themselves. I'll start with myself. My name is Joan McAlpine. I'm a Member of Parliament for the South of Scotland and I'm the convener of the committee. Lewis MacDonald, Labour Member for North East Scotland and Deputy Convener of the committee. Mary Evans, I'm the SNP MSP for Angus, North and Mearns in the northeast of Scotland. Richard Lockett, MSP for Murray, Whiskey Country. Uh, Jackson Carlo, the MSP for Eastwood, which is on the south side of Glasgow in the west of Scotland and deputy leader of the Scottish Conservatives. Uh, I'm Tavish Scott. I represent the islands of Shetland in the very far north, 200 miles to the north of uh, Aberdeen. Uh, so on the periphery of the periphery of the periphery of Europe, uh, and I'm a Liberal Democrat. I'm uh, Katyusha Marini. I'm uh, the president of the Socialist Group at the Committee of Region. I come from Italy, and I'm um, in Italy the president of the region of Umbria in the center of Italy. My name is Karl-Heinz Lamberts. I'm the first vice president of the Committee of the Regions, and I'm from Belgium, from the German-speaking minority in Belgium. I uh, am a member of the Belgian Senate, and I, I am also a member of the parliament of the German-speaking community, and I was uh, minister and prime minister there for uh, 24 years. Um, Marco Marcula, the president of the Committee of the Region, and... Uh, as said, so I've been here uh, once before in your parliament. I've been to Edinburgh several times as well in the past. Uh, I'm uh, uh, the uh, chair of the board of my own city, Espo, the second largest city in Finland. But I even originally come from very far from the north, so Scotland is close to my heart as well. From that respect, I was born out of the Arctic Circle and went to school there in Lapland. So we have much to share with Scotland and Finland. And my name is uh, Ulrike Karlefall Landegren, and also a member of the Committee of the Region and the first vice president of the Elder Group. Uh, I'm a mun municipal commissioner at Kungsbacka. It's a city uh, near Gothenburg at the west coast in Sweden. Hi, my name is Olga Geblevich. Uh, I'm a uh, Committee of Regions member. I'm representing here uh, the EPP group and uh, I'm from Poland and I'm, uh, I, I can say that I'm a president of one of Polish, uh, Polish region on the Baltic Sea. But in Poland, uh, we don't have a president on this uh, regional level. We call them marshal. So I'm a marshal of a West Pomeranian region. It, it is not military position. It is executive body. So, uh, so I'm a chair, chairman of a board. Uh, and, and I'm very first time here. I'm, and I'm glad that I'm here. Thank you. Uh, I'm Stanislaw Schwabski. I'm uh, president of uh, uh, European Alliance uh, within the Committee of the Regions. Uh, uh, I am uh, from, I am Polish, I am from uh, the, the city of Gdynia, it's a city on the Baltic Sea, uh, but on the eastern part of uh, Polish uh, border on Baltic, uh, my colleague is from western part, uh, I am uh, councillor of Gdynia, thank you. Good morning, my name is uh, Rob Jonkman. I'm the president of the ECR group. I'm an uh, alderman uh, in the city of uh, Opsterland in the northern part of the Netherlands. 
Uh, it's my first time here in Edinburgh, and it's not the first time uh, that I drank whiskey uh, last night. So, <laughs> but, uh, and I, I, I like it. I love it, I must say. Yeah. Hi, uh, good morning. My name's Stuart McMillan, MSP. I'm the M MSP for the Greenock and Inverclyde constituency, and I'm a Scottish National Party member. Morning, I'm Ross Greer. I'm an MSP for the Green Party for the West of Scotland region. Uh, thank you very much. And can I say to members that there's no need for you to press any of the buttons. Um, the microphones will work automatically. Uh, you've come to Scotland at an important moment. Uh, tomorrow is the one-year anniversary of the referendum at which the UK uh, as a whole, uh, but not Scotland, uh, voted to leave the European Union. As you will be aware, 62% of people in Scotland voted to remain in the EU. Uh, furthermore, the process of withdrawing from the EU has now started. On Monday, the European Commission and the UK government initiated the Article 50 negotiations to leave the EU. And yesterday, the Queen's speech at Westminster set out the UK government's programme for government and included proposals for a great repeal bill to ensure that EU legislation continued to have an effect in the UK. It also included proposals for other legislation to adapt to the UK's future outside the EU. And tonight, the UK's Prime Minister will inform the EU27 of her intentions as regards the negotiations on the withdrawal of the United Kingdom from the EU. Despite it being almost a year from the referendum, there is still a lack of clarity on the future relationship that the UK will seek with the EU. The UK government's white paper stated that the UK would forge a new strategic partnership with the EU, including a wide-reaching, bold and ambitious free trade agreement, and that it would seek a mutually beneficial new customs agreement with the EU. However, we know that the EU27 consider that it is not possible to have full access to the single market without being a member of that single market. We therefore know that some sectors in Scotland will be affected by Brexit, but we do not know at this stage which ones will be hardest hit. This committee has engaged extensively with stakeholders from key sectors in Scotland, as well as individuals who will be affected by withdrawal from the EU. And we've published four reports of our own covering a wide range of issues, including EU citizens' rights and the implications of Brexit for key sectors in Scotland, the intergovernmental structures within the UK for discussing the UK's approach to withdrawal, and the respective positions of the Scottish Government and the UK Government. We have also commissioned three reports from experts on the long-term economic implications of, of Brexit, the impact of Brexit on the devolution settlement, and the potential for differentiating the UK's immigration policy to respond to Scotland's needs. Uh, one of those pieces of research by the Fraser of Allender Institute based at the University of Strathclyde found that the implications of a hard Brexit for Scotland would be the loss of 80,000 jobs over 10 years and the value of uh, an annual salary um, would reduce by £2,000 uh, by the end of those 10 years. Um, another of our reports um, said that the rights of EU citizens should, uh, should be clarified at the earliest opportunity and it also outlined the value of EU migration to Scotland whose demographic decline has been sharply uh, reversed uh, by EU migration and we argued that there should be a a, a, a separate uh, migration system for Scotland uh, post-Brexit. Uh, our final report on the future of Scotland uh, post-Brexit argued that there should be a bespoke solution for Scotland. Uh, the Scottish Government, of course, as you may know, has argued uh, for a separate solution which would allow Scotland to remain uh, within the single market, even if the UK uh, left the EU as reflected the 62% of Scots who voted to remain in the EU. Uh, our committee has heard significant concerns from some sectors, for example, 
Will Scotland's universities be able to continue to participate in research programmes with other European universities? Will EU academics continue to seek to work in Scottish universities? Will the exponential growth of Scotland's food and drink sector, a very successful export sector, be sustainable post-Brexit? Will we still be able to welcome EU citizens to Scotland to make their homes here and contribute to our society and economy? And will the future relationship cover services, a hugely important part of Scotland's economy? Scotland's financial services sector uh, must be able to operate freely within the EU. Uh, another question would be, will our producers be able to export to the EU without the uh, imposition of tariffs and non-tariff barriers? This Parliament itself will be affected as the huge job of adapting our domestic legislation to the EU withdrawal is undertaken. And there is a political debate about uh, the balance of powers between this Parliament and the Westminster Parliament, with the Scottish Government arguing that the Brexit process is undermining uh, the powers of this Parliament. Although you will hear different views on that uh, from colleagues uh, around the table uh, today. I hope our discussions today can explore many of these areas in more detail and I also hope that our discussions can start a dialogue between us uh, on the implications of Brexit for, once the implications of Brexit for Scotland become clearer. Uh, Mr Markula, as President of the Committee of the Regions, I welcome you again uh, and I invite you to take the floor to set out your views and your role from an EU perspective on the UK's withdrawal from the EU. Thank you. Um, thank you, thank you very much, uh, uh, John, for inviting us here, and thank you for organising this very effective one-day programme that we have. And I think that we all will get a lot out of this. And uh, let me first uh, say that a year ago, when we got the result of the referendum, so we were really surprised. We said that we regret that, but we respect that. And the result is what it is, but now it's, it's time and has been already to look forward and the process, especially after your uh, uh, recent election, will be very complicated one. We hope that it will be flexible and that it will take uh, especially into account the two most important levels that what I see. It's, it's the citizen level, so including those who now uh, uh, EU from other EU countries who now live and operate here in, in Scotland. Uh, that really is a big, uh, big uh, number, close to 200,000 EU citizens from other countries are here, more, more like permanently, and they have been e excellent ambassadors for our countries from all around Europe on this, uh, getting to know more about Scotland. And then on the other hand, we uh, the, the other important level is how we do, from the local and regional perspective, how we do business, how we do uh, uh, educational collaboration, all those elements and cultural, of course, uh, fishery policy included, so that how we do all these operations in, in concrete terms, what we have already started and people have started uh, to believe and strongly see the European value added coming from this open and all the time improving collaboration. Now we are very afraid that uh, one way or another there will be a big, big ob obstacles on that. It does not help much that uh, the top political level uh, 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 is said and, and is, uh, is, and is uh, said regularly that okay, uh, yeah, UK wants to be a European country in the future as well, because on the, at the same time we, the rest in EU through the European Union, we are renewing our practices, our structures, our policies, our processes, and we want to be. The, the, the concrete EU 27, or hopefully it could be a 28, but the EU 27 much, much uh, uh, targeted to tackle the societal challenges, much faster moving to single market, uh, digital uh, single market included on that. And, and this free trade more based on the certain rules and regulations agreed. 
But that's, that's for the people, that's for our businesses, and we need to tackle these more and more uh, in, in the global sense. Especially now, when we have agreed major, major, major agreements on Paris, uh, on the climate change, continued, renewed some of the elements of that in Marrakesh, and are now preparing for next November in the climate change negotiation, next phase in Bonn, after that in Poland, in Krakow, a year from that. So there are major concerns that our cities and regions and our citizens are having. And now when we are looking what the, the results of the, the, the uh, activities of, in the U.S. and their recent development, so we need to take much more responsibility than we thought on this global development into our hands in, in Europe. But that means above all so that uh, the uh, crucial level of activity, it is regional and local. That's where the action is. We know that we need national governments, we need European Council to negotiate, get certain agreements, we need European Parliament, but still action and more of the activities that are needed that happen by the people, with the people and for the people. And that's important when we think these aspects that, that we are having uh, here. Um, it's, uh, these uh, reasons that, that we came here today, we want to listen to your concerns and echo in Brussels uh, your views and your suggestions on the recently started negotiations on, on Brexit. In this juncture, it's important to recall that Brexit will trigger many consequences for citizens and their regional local authorities, both in the UK and in the 27 countries uh, of the, the rest of EU. Some of the UK's territories have land or sea borders with EU member states or a lot bilateral agreements, uh, collaboration in concrete terms with he uh, heavy implications from security to migration, from energy to fishery policy, from school collaboration of young children to the uh, scientific research by the universities. All of those are essential for our people. The local economy has been built in uh, the last uh, uh, half century in Scotland, as in other regions, on the solid assumption of an internal European market at its disposal. The risk uh, to lose this security is a shared concern. European cohesion policy, which is a must in the future as well, uh, we just tackled uh, the future prospects of Europe uh, a month ago in our plenary with the Speaker, uh, the President of the European Parliament, Tajani, with the Vice President of the Commission, Katainen, and with Commissioner Oettinger dealing these issues. And it was a very lively debate, but it all came to the same conclusion on one hand, so that we need cohesion policy, we need to build more on the solidarity and collaboration. And this means that uh, the cities and regions are building stronger partnerships, focusing on their specific uh, core interest areas, so we can in a way build the, the critical mass of knowledge and implementation as well, based on the strengths and interests of different parts of Europe. And on that, so one way or another, we want uh, Scotland and uh, uh, cities and regions of the whole UK to be part of. But that's the next uh, two years or who, who knows how long it will take, uh, how we process on that. Uh, we from our side, so we have, and we will, a committee of the region with our 350 members and another 350 alternates coming from all parts of, of, of uh, Europe, we have uh, key mayors there, we have regional presidents, councillors, and what has happened in a year, so this is very much more bottom-up nowadays. The commissioners uh, uh, are asking us strongly to take action and showcasing what is happening on a positive sense, how our cities and regions are tackling these grand societal challenges and building the future and I need to stress, it needs to be sustainable growth. Growth, but, but sustainable. And 
that can create new jobs and that is uh, our key priority as well. We have analyzed and we will analyze the Brexit effect in the different concerned policies. From the EU side, the Brexit cap in uh, terms of financing is estimated from 10 to 17 billion euros per year, and that has an enormous impact on us in renewing the EU structures and financial frame. And we are working on our, on our side on that, but we can convince you as well so that, that uh, we see that this Brexit process will positively renew European Union as well. So we build on our strengths, on our joint European collaboration, but take the different elements into account, and that's what we would like to hear from you as well. What are your concerns? What uh, the EU should be, uh, how these operations should be, and how we, we want to uh, develop that further on. But let me then conclude that uh, we have received an offer for cooperation from the chief negotiator of the European Commission, Michel Barnier. We have met him already several times. He has uh, contributed our plenary as well. And addressing our members, he confirmed his interest in listening to the remarks coming from the regional and local authorities all through the process. Therefore, also, we are, uh, via our committee, you will be able at any moment uh, you wish to address, inform or consult both uh, the us and, uh, and through us, the chief negotiator, and those particular European regions politically involved uh, in the secession process. And that, I think, is important, taking the different aspects of of your interest and your citizens' interest on, on this occasion and on that. So I think this, your official meeting as well here is, is an important one, especially looking at the, the role of you linking culture to the uh, European activities. I think that is always the crucial one. Next year will be the European Year of Heritage. So we look backwards, but we use the historical knowledge and the new scientific knowledge building the future of Europe and want to be that stronger, much stronger, and taking the global aspects into account very strongly. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, President Merkula. I would now like to invite the convener of the committee, Lewis MacDonald, to make a few remarks. Thank you very much, Convener, and uh, it's a pleasure to follow President Markula as Deputy Convener of the Committee, just to add a little about what, uh, to what Joan already said about the work of the Committee thus far. Uh, the uh, uh, next stage, of course, for our Committee is to scrutinise the negotiations that will happen as part of the Article 50 process. And as you will all be aware, the uh, Article 50 negotiations have just begun. They will focus uh, principally, in the first instance, on three areas, the financial settlement, uh, the position vis-a-vis -vis the Republic of Ireland and Northern Ireland, uh, and also, the, of course, the critical issue of the rights of European Union citizens resident uh, in the UK and, indeed, of UK citizens resident elsewhere in the EU. So uh, we will seek to scrutinise all of those aspects and, and other things that happen in that initial process of the Article 50 negotiations. Uh, we've just launched a call for evidence uh, and asked uh, stakeholders here in Scotland and, and indeed further afield uh, to give us their uh, input, uh, their concerns and their priorities and to uh, follow, uh, to engage, encourage them to engage with us and to follow that process as, as it goes forward. Clearly as a committee of the Scottish Parliament, our primary responsibility is to scrutinise the work of the Scottish Government and we know that uh, the engagement of the Scottish Government with the UK Government in order to seek to influence the negotiations will be critical for us and uh, for many stakeholders in Scotland. So we will continue to seek evidence from Scottish Government Ministers and of course also from UK Government Ministers involved in the uh, negotiations uh, going forward. We will also take evidence from other stakeholders and indeed from members of the European Parliament and others in Brussels, and we intend to uh, visit Brussels in September as part of that uh, uh, investigation or part of that uh, report that we will compile on the Article 50 negotiations. Now, the way that the Scottish Parliament uh, is structured, indeed, we discussed this morning how the different committees of the Scottish Parliament would deal with the different aspects 
of the Brexit process. Uh, as the convener mentioned, the, uh, uh, the, the repeal bill, which is, will come forward from in the UK Parliament, will have substantial implications for Scotland. It will touch on many areas of policy which are devolved to the Scottish Parliament, agriculture, fisheries, environment, home affairs, uh, among others. And it will also touch on the fundamental constitution of the Scottish Parliament because Section 28 of the, Scottish, of the original Scotland Act, which is our founding uh, document, says that all legislation of the Scottish Parliament must comply with the legislation of the European Union. Uh, clearly, that fundamental uh, aspect of our constitution will be uh, immediately affected by the Brexit process. So there are many aspects uh, which will fall under the remit of the Finance and Constitution Committee of this Parliament. Uh, our committee will have a particular focus on the negotiation process. And when the Article 50 negotiation process is completed, we anticipate uh, uh, in future uh, having a, a scrutiny role in relation to the uh, negotiations around the creation of a long-term framework for the relationship between uh, the UK and the European Union. So there are uh, a number of those things going forward, uh, which this committee will keep a, a close watch in brief upon. And uh, having spent much of our time in the last 12 months on Brexit, we anticipate spending a good deal of our time in the next 12 months uh, on the next stage of Brexit as well. Convener, if I may move on to a, a, a rather more political perspective, because I know that uh, members of the Committee of the Regions are keen to hear the political perspectives of the different parties in Scotland. And as a member of the Scottish Labour Party, and also indeed as an alternate member of the Committee of the Regions, and through that a member of the Party of European Socialists, I uh, would like to offer you my perspective, and I know other colleagues around the table will, will do the same. Clearly, we've just had a general election in the UK, which... Uh, has very significant implications for the whole Brexit process. I think from my party's point of view, we're very disappointed that the UK government, minority government as it now is, does not appear to have changed its strategic objectives or its tactical approach to the negotiations. That, of course, may not be a permanent feature uh, that may change in coming weeks, uh, but certainly questions such as the United Kingdom's continued membership of the Customs Union seem to me uh, should be very firmly back on the table uh, and back in, uh, in the focus of what we want to do. There, is, uh, there are many benefits of both the single market and the customs union uh, from which the present Conservative government appears to have uh, simply walked away and turned their backs on, on those benefits. We clearly take a different view and believe that those benefits are very important to us, to our people and to uh, our economy and that we should seek to preserve those. Uh, principal uh, and I think first question for the negotiations going forward is the status of European Union citizens in this country and of British citizens elsewhere in the EU and we certainly believe that the British government should be much more proactive in putting forward uh, uh, a very positive offer uh, and proposition on that in order to resolve that question quickly in a way that allows uh, as much uh, uh, continued access and, and as many continued rights as possible for those European Union citizens who are, who are here uh, and indeed for British citizens elsewhere. So, so from a, a Labour perspective, we also, I think it's important also to say there is a case for the devolved administrations to be engaged with the process. The Welsh Government, the Scottish Government have made that case we, we see a real political difficulty uh, with the approach of the current Scottish Government in their uh, insistence on at the same time having a proposition for a referendum of independence on the table. We believe the case for engagement by the devolved administrations would be much stronger with a commitment to uh, maintain the future benefits uh, for the whole UK and, and negotiating as part of a, a UK approach. But the most important thing is not so much the cast, it's the tune and we would like to hear a much more positive tune uh, being played on behalf of the whole United Kingdom in the relations with, and the negotiations with the, with the European Union in the next few months. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Deputy Convener. I'd now like to welcome the first Vice President, Mr. Lambitz, to contribute to our discussions. Thank you very much, uh, Mrs. Chair, dear colleagues. I would also like to express my gratitude and my satisfaction 
that we can change our point of views with the members of the Scottish Parliament. That way we can directly try to explore how we can work together in a very, very difficult and complex situation. Even if nothing is perfect in the European Union, and even if we need many, many changes, I continue to believe strongly and even passionately in the idea of a united European Union. And so do also many people in Scotland and in the rest of the United Kingdom. With the results of the referendum, as they are, and the way that people have voted after it, we now have to find the best possible solution. Finally, that is why we, are all, we, we all become, became politicians, politicians. We fully support the request made at various stages for all the devolved governments, and indeed also local uh, governments, to be as involved as possible in the negotiations. We do not know in detail how Brexit will work yet, but we do know that it will affect many, many things in the daily life of our citizens where they live, in villages, in towns, in cities, and uh, also in regions. It will escape uh, the way uh, you will govern in Scotland, and it will have an impact of many regions across all the European Union. We have mentioned already the rights of citizens, trade, regional development, or fisheries and agriculture. I would like to add to this uh, environment and climate change, but also many other political challenges, such as security and law enforcement or migration. These are all challenges where physical borders do not and should not matter and whatever agreement is reached between the United Kingdom and the European Union in the end, political decisions on the ground will be affected by decisions taken elsewhere. That is why we need to exchange information. We need to start building structures which we can ensure, with which we can ensure cooperation in the future and start exploring on which issues and through what means this can be realized. I note with great interest that you have launched a call for evidence on the implications of Article 50 for Scotland, and we would be very interested to follow in detail with you uh, the results. In the Committee of the Regions, we will also continue to explore policy by uh, policy, what Brexit mean uh, really, and how it may affect individual regions. Dear colleagues, let's try to make the best of this difficult situation together. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Uh, would um, our other guests like to raise any questions at this stage to open up the discussion? Or I could invite... Yes. Yes, uh, um, uh, please. I have two uh, questions. Um, um, first, um, I read that uh, um, uh, your purpose is to stay uh, into the, uh, the single market uh, as, as Scotland. Um, are there any indications that uh, that is really a possibility? Uh, I heard from you that there are already uh, spoken about the Brexit uh, a year, of course. And uh, do you have an indication that there might be in the negotiations a possibility to stay in the single market for Scotland, or is it too soon to say something about it? And the other question is, um, what main messages would you like to pass uh, onto uh, the EU about uh, the areas where you would like to see continued uh, cooperation uh, after the, e uh, uh, the, the UK exit from the EU? Thank you. I think the question that you ask um, is relating to the first question is relating to the Scottish Government's position. Um, the Scottish Government published a, a extensive paper um, just before Christmas arguing that in the first instance the UK should stay in the single market um, and failing that um, there should be a differentiated uh, solution for Scotland and pointed to differentiated solutions and political solutions within the European uh, Union. Um, 
what we have heard is that if the UK government had uh, accepted that position um, and uh, allowed Scotland to present it, then the EU would have given us a fair hearing um, and been open to discuss discussions about it. And my understanding is that that's why the Scottish Government are continuing to argue that there should be a four-nation approach uh, to Brexit. Uh, but so far, it's unclear how the UK Government has, is going to respond to that since the general election. Certainly before the general election, the process of intergovernmental relations, um, uh, the, devolved, um, the devolved territories were very critical of the way that they were being treated in that intergovernmental uh, process. Um, beyond uh, beyond uh, Brexit, as we know, it's very, and as I said in my open statements, it's quite unclear what the UK government hoped to achieve in their negotiations. And we're obviously at quite an unstable period in terms of where the UK government uh, actually is. Um, but certainly Scotland's um, what we've gathered as a committee from Scotland's businesses is that access to the single market and free movement of people is absolutely vital to, the, um, to our economy. And our university sector is very keen to be able to um, continue with the collaborative projects um, with European countries that uh, uh, have really benefited their sector and Scotland as a whole. Jackson, did you want to come in? Yeah, thank you. Um, I represent the Conservative Party uh, here. Um, we are the largest of the opposition parties here in Scotland, and in whatever guise you care to consider it, the government of the United Kingdom, who are charged with taking forward the negotiations that are underway. President, you, you began by saying you were surprised by the result. Uh, I voted to remain. Your surprise was nothing as compared to mine, and indeed this committee, when we met after our own election here last May to plan our work programme for the year ahead. I have to say Europe wasn't the largest of the things we thought we would be having to consider as our agenda item for business. And in fact, it's been almost all we've had time to talk about. But we have, in fact, had a year of engaging with the unknown. Uh, and, and I think that has been one of the most frustrating aspects of it. We have heard everybody's fears. We have heard everybody's concerns. Um, some of them are founded. Some of the realities are frightening enough without actually the uh, broader contextual arguments that, that surround them. I, I won't be pejorative in terms of the politics of this from the Conservative Party's point of view. Obviously, we don't share the uh, Scottish Government's analysis of how we proceed. Um, we do believe that ultimately the vote which I didn't support but which we uh, accepted will lead to us leaving the European Union. Uh, and what do we want from that? Well. Uh, I think it's clear we want control of our own borders, we want control of our own laws, and we want to maintain the broadest possible uh, trade that we can. And in that regard, our, our own Treasury and others um, are starting to articulate where we might want to end up in any discussion, and I find some of their arguments quite compelling. So from my point of view, uh, given the demographics of Scotland as a country with a, a rapidly aging population, it's important that we have in the future a workforce which is capable of sustaining our public services and ensuring that we have an entrepreneurial dynamic to our economy which will allow us to prosper as a nation. So uh, it does seem to me that you know where people feature in all of this is of fundamental importance. Uh, we obviously want to maintain the broadest possible economic activity across the widest uh, possible territory, but clearly we recognise the very important and fundamental uh, relationship that we have economically with the rest of the European Union. People do have to come at the top of all of this. I, I understand the Prime Minister is making a, a, a policy statement today to European heads of government in relation to the status of European nationals here and obviously of British nationals across Europe. I think we want to understand and to resolve that as quickly as possible and everybody seems to believe that there is a tremendous amount of goodwill underpinning that desire. We want to obviously cooperate again on education. So many young people, I think, who voted differently in this referendum. I know my own children were furious with their grandmother. They didn't, uh, they, they had voted differently and their view is she'll be dead and they'll still be here. And uh, I think that, that they feel that the, that the challenges that are presented to them are quite considerable. And so we obviously look to the future for them across the whole of Europe and the way that they can engage and participate 
in what they thought was a, an established arrangement, but which now obviously is called into question. There's a lot that we want to do in the development of medical uh, technology. We understand that. We, there's a lot of dependency in terms of our security, not just from the immediate threats that have been facing nations without fear or favor, really, in terms of uh, terrorism, but obviously of the wider geopolitical defense arrangements in which we all have a very common interest and bond. Uh, and, of course, fundamentally, there is the issue of the economic relationship that exists between us. All the discussions I've participated in um, have had a sort of slightly formalese, uh, formal kind of aspect to them, and then behind it, a, a desperate desire for some sort of pragmatic arrangement, respecting, I think, what you said about the 27 who will remain and obviously want to ensure the integrity and strength of the European Union that remains, but nonetheless desiring of an outcome which ensures that while you, Britain may no longer be a formal member of the European Union, that that European partnership in which Britain has played a part is allowed to continue. So, uh, without denigrating anybody else's perspective on all of this, uh, you know, I hope and intend to remain an optimist with my glass half full, not half empty. I don't underestimate the challenges. I don't actually underestimate the fact of the many sleepless nights we may have here simply progressing what seems to be interminably complicated legislation to give effect to anything that is ultimately agreed. But I hope and believe that the goodwill that exists that you represent, that the people we have who represent it on the Committee of the Regions will be allowed to triumph ultimately in whatever outcome we, we arrive at. Thank you, Jackson. I believe you wanted to come in, Tavish. Thank you. Um, I just want to give a slightly different perspective as a Liberal Democrat. Firstly, I um, do not like what happened. Uh, the United Kingdom did vote over, well, overall to leave the European Union last year, but Scotland didn't, nor did Northern Ireland, nor importantly did lots of parts of England and London. So don't, don't, you'll get this perspective that it's just Scotland and all that kind of thing. It's actually really important to remember that large chunks of England actually voted to remain in the United Kingdom, as, in the European Union as well, particularly London. And when you look at the London Financial Centre and the fact that in Brussels, as Jason Carlos just rightly said, in Brussels today they are contemplating how to take two main financial uh, mechanisms out of London and locate them somewhere else in Europe, there's going to be an impact. And we've had, as the convener might have mentioned earlier on, representatives here from the City of London pointing that out and the damage that'll do to, to London. So um, it, what happened um, a week ago in terms of the United Kingdom general election is actually really important. The straight politics of that are really important now because a year ago, no one voted to leave the single market. No one voted to be poorer. No one voted to be worse off. They voted for lots of different reasons, but they didn't vote for those things. So Theresa May went into the general election here in the United Kingdom saying, vote for me for a hard Brexit for a big majority of Conservatives who will then impose that, that hard solution on immigration and all those other things on the United Kingdom. She lost. She didn't win that argument. She absolutely lost that argument. And we are now in a very different place. So your question about the single market, the convener is quite right. This thing's up in the air now. The convener was much more delicate than I'll be, but this thing is right up in the air now. The Chancellor of the Exchequer, our main economic ministry, made a speech two days ago in which he, in, in all but name, said the single market matters to the United Kingdom. That's because the whole of the United Kingdom business is telling him the single market matters. So I think this thing's all up in the air. I wouldn't take anything that's said by Theresa May in Brussels now as, as anything other than her, her latest position, which will, be, which will last five minutes. She may not be the Prime Minister next week. It's like John Major's days. For those of you who remember British politics, it's like John Major's days. This looks so weak down in London now. So I think the, um, the context of where we are in Europe now as a United Kingdom, never mind Scotland, is utterly open. It's now going to depend on how long the Conservative government hold themselves together. It's going to depend on how long Theresa May stays as Prime Minister, how long they leave her there, because that's what it now is. She's the weakest Prime Minister we've had since John Major lost his overall majority. That's where it now is. And... Uh, what happens in the future is, is, is very different from where we would have been had the Tories won an overall majority of anything over 50, which is what they expected to win. So in that sense, I have some hope for the future because I, don't think, because I now know that she has no mandate, the Tories have no mandate to impose a hard Brexit on us. And therefore, um, the, the Scottish Parliament, the Welsh Assembly, importantly as well, the Northern Ireland Assembly, when they get back into being in, being, uh, in uh, legislative existence, will have responsibilities in terms of, the, as the convener said, of, of uh, what may flow out of Westminster. But even that, we don't know what will flow out of Westminster. So I, it's all up in the air. Um, I'll finish with this. The President of France made a speech, or, or 
or uh, certainly met journalists from across Europe yesterday and said two things that for me were quite important. The first is that that door is always open until it's closed, which is self-evidently the case, but important. Uh, and secondly, he respected why lots of Brits had voted to leave the European Union. And let me leave you with this. I represent Shetland. Uh, the, the reason that uh, the vote against, the vote to leave in Shetland was as high as it was, and we still voted to remain in, but it was as high as it was, was because of the common fisheries policy. The thing you need to remember is that some things, and I think you reflected that, some things the European Union do and are awful about reforming just don't work. And, and that's the problem a big, big structure has. And the common fisheries policy for me in my part of the world is an example of that. It's been wrong for 30 years. Why the heck hasn't it been changed? So um, if the European Union is going to be the, the kind of institution and, the, and the, the group of nations I want it to be in the future, it has to recognize, as Macron did yesterday in, in Paris, what's wrong as well as what it needs to do to get right. Thank you for coming. Uh. Thank you, Tavish. Now, um, all our members have indicated a desire uh, to speak, so I, I know that you want to hear as many views as possible, so I'll just take our members in turn uh, that they've indicated they wanted to speak, so I'll invite Mary Evans first. Thank you. I would really just agree with a lot of what Tavish Scott has just said, and it's probably not often that I, that I would say that, um, but I, I respect a lot of what you said. I mean, I feel that in particular, the issues that, are, that matter to me, to the people in my area, are migration. That's, that is going to be a key issue moving forward. Uh, obviously, we have a lot of... I, I live in quite a rural area. Agriculture is very important. Across the northeast, fishing is very important. Tavish identified the problems with the common fishing policy but in terms of the fish processing sector obviously we employ a lot of EU nationals in terms of soft food industries but even going beyond that in tourism in our, our health and social care we are largely dependent on uh, a migrant worker uh, working force and that is what's going to be vital going forward and I think that I don't take much comfort I know that we'll see the an immigration bill coming forward we get hints of that in the the, the Queen's speech what that immigration Immigration policy will look like we don't know um, but that's one thing that is absolutely vital to our economy here and one thing that we have to get right and that's where the devolved nations have to have a say and have to have an input in any discussions and negotiations uh, that take place. We are a separate country in our own right. I do feel that sometimes in, in Europe and in different European organizations that you know we're seen more as a, a region than in a country in our own right it's a, in our of ourselves and I think that that has to be borne in mind we have different issues we have different interests here we have different needs and we do need different policies to the rest of the UK in specific areas I think another vitally important area is in terms of funding in terms of all sorts of funds uh, I and, and different programmes across the European Union as well. Uh, Leader being a, an important one for rural communities, uh, how, how this will work uh, post-Brexit, if all of that goes ahead. Um, I do think that a lot of, a lot of that was lost in the, the discussions leading up to the referendum, and I think it's only once the vote had taken place people started to realise the extent to which we were uh, involved and dependent on in, in EU funds and the impact that those funds had had. I remember a study from the EU Commission a few years ago which went to different countries across Europe to ask the, the, the public, you know, their what were they aware of EU funded projects in their area and I think Poland had the highest uh, response rate of about 75% of people there were aware of EU funded projects in their area and the UK had the lowest people aren't aware we didn't talk about it um, but again we are where we are now but I think that's an important thing going forward how we're still uh, and especially in terms of common agricultural policy what will happen to our farmers uh, how will all these payments how will all of that work and and how will all that uh, it would be teased out uh, over the coming while. So for me, those are the particular issues. And as I say, Scotland has to have a seat in the negotiating table um, because we need to be represented there. Thank you, Manny. The next person who uh, has indicated they would like to speak is Richard Lockhead. Thank you. <clears throat> so I'm a Scottish National Party member for Murray in the north of Scotland, uh, which is also, as I indicated earlier, the home of Scotch whisky, in that 50% by volume of Scotch whisky comes from Speyside. Macallan, Glenfiddich, some of the famous brands are based there. And the Scotch whisky sector, of course, issued a statement yesterday saying that 
Continuity and stability from day one of Brexit is very, very important in the Scotch whisky sector. So clearly they're looking for a good agreement between the UK and the European Union. <clears throat> Scotland is a country, we're not a region. And whilst Tavish Scott is quite right to highlight that other parts of the UK voted to leave, uh, remain, like Scotland did, and 62% of Scots voted to remain, uh, we do have a national parliament in this country. And we do have... Uh, other national institutions. So we are not a region, we're a country. Therefore, the debate in Scotland is different to the debate in London. And that's why the Scottish Government have said that once the terms of Brexit become clear, clearly at that stage, there should be the option of Scotland having a different choice in terms of the future. And that's why the whole debate around the independence referendum has been a feature of the, the Brexit debate in Scotland over the last year or so. Clearly, Scotland is looking for a bespoke arrangement, and the compromise the Scottish Government have asked from the UK Government is for that to be taken into account. So the independence referendum clearly is not necessary, because if we had a bespoke arrangement and the UK Government were negotiating with the Scottish Government to make that happen as part of the UK's negotiating position, that would help the Scottish economy and Scotland greatly. So the two key areas are access to the single market, and the second area is immigration. And quite clearly, immigration dictates the UK policy on Brexit far more so than the Scottish policy on Brexit. And that's because the Conservative Party and the UK government are very sensitive to the public opinion and internal party politics over immigration in England. And perhaps the economy is not the predominant consideration, it's more immigration. Whereas in Scotland, we are very concerned about the future of our economy, and central to that is immigration, especially given that we have an ageing population, as Jackson Carlaw mentioned as well. So that's why Scotland is very keen on a bespoke arrangement, because of our national interests. And our national interests are access to the single market and membership of the single market, and powers devolved to Scotland over immigration policy. The final comment I want to make is that, as the President said in his opening remarks, Europe is not perfect, and the common fisheries policy has failed Scotland. I would also argue, to a large degree, the common agricultural policy has failed Scotland. I've met very few farmers who voted to remain within the EU, and I've, I've met next to no fishermen who voted to remain within the EU. So, despite the ongoing debate over the importance of the single market to seafood, because two-thirds of Scottish seafood goes to Europe, and the importance of the single market to agriculture, because it's very important in terms of tariffs and um, equal standards and, and market uh, opportunities as well. These policies have been a very bad advert for the European Union in Scotland. So whatever happens going forward, uh, these two policies uh, will continue to remain very unpopular in Scotland unless something radical is done. But that's a debate for the future. Very much, Stuart McMillan. Uh, thank you, convener. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, the Vice President, uh, in your, your opening remarks, uh, you spoke of the input uh, from parliaments and uh, local government uh, into the process. And uh, some colleagues have touched upon well, immigration access to the single market. But, um, but my, uh, well, I think my, f my first point is that I think everyone would want to have some type of a positive outcome you know, from any discussions that take place. I don't think anyone would want other than that. But um, when you then start to take it down to the next level and, uh, and look at the details uh, of what may or may not happen, uh, one of my uh, m large fears in this is in terms of uh, the power grab uh, that may happen. So with powers that uh, leave the European Union, then come back uh, to, to these islands, and uh, the possibility of, uh, particularly over like, fisheries and agriculture, uh, these powers then remaining at Westminster and then not coming to, uh, to the Scottish Parliament. I, I think that would uh, have a, an adverse effect uh, upon uh, the Scottish economy, which uh, Richard Lockhead uh, was just talking about. I think that would be uh, extremely detrimental to our economic prospects uh, going forward. Um, Another aspect, uh, just as regarding the, 
Uh, well, the repeal bill was uh, highlighted yesterday in the Queen's speech, uh, and the, the discussions, well, the situation regarding um, what, uh, what role this Parliament will actually play in the repeal bill. Um, now, I think this, it was uh, Lewis MacDonald uh, spoke about the, the, the competences of the Scottish Parliament um, and the, the initial uh, Scotland Act uh, to create uh, this Parliament uh, and how, uh, in Section 28 of that particular uh, legislation, uh, so there is some, but there is a lack of clarity in terms of the role that this Parliament will actually play in that uh, legislative process regarding the repeal bill, and that's something that the UK government uh, really needs to clarify. Uh, I think another aspect is in terms of the, well, the, the discussions between, uh, well, internally within uh, the UK, the discussions between the governments uh, and the roles of the governments uh, having an input into, uh, into, the, into that aspect of the, of the process. Now, there, is, there has been the, the GMC, now the Joint Ministerial uh, Council, and uh, that uh, it's been, we've had discussions in this committee uh, and we've had representatives from the UK government um, speak uh, to this committee regarding the, uh, the whole aspects of, uh, of what has taken place thus far. And, uh, and it's clear that the GMC process um, hasn't been perfect. Uh, and certainly going forward, uh, I have a concern that uh, the UK government uh, might once again decide not to fully listen to the concerns not just of Scotland, but some elsewhere uh, within the UK, but also my primary concern is about obviously, uh, Scotland. So I, I do have a concern that um, uh, suggestions and ideas and, and proposals put forward are, are once again uh, just uh, rejected outright uh, by the UK government. Uh, and the, my final point is just uh, I, uh, regarding, uh, once again, well, can I come back to the issue of the, of the lack of clarity and confusion? Just shortly after the UK election, the Secretary of State uh, for Scotland, um, uh, Mr Mandel, uh, had uh, obviously quite clearly he was delighted to have obviously so many more new colleagues uh, in this party. Uh, but uh, publicly he, he came out with a, a comment regarding um, the Conservative MPs uh, representing uh, non-independent supporting uh, members of the public. But then only a couple of days ago we've had uh, the... Well, the well, Ian Duncan, the former MP, now, has now been ennobled, um, stating that, the, that Scotland should actually have a seat uh, at, the, at the table in terms of negotiation. So I think that's a confusing uh, position, or well, two confusing positions, uh, from the well, senior representatives uh, of, uh, of the UK government. So ultimately, uh, I think we have a, uh, we're in an absolute mess. It, it, it is an absolute constitutional crisis uh, within the UK. Uh, and, the, uh, and the, the power grab option and opportunity that is there for, uh, for Westminster is absolutely apparent. But there is an opportunity uh, for, uh, because, well, because of the, the minority uh, government at the UK, there is an opportunity to actually get something better uh, for Scotland and for elsewhere uh, uh, within the UK to actually have a better uh, offering and a better deal if the UK government are prepared to listen, uh, but uh, I do have my doubts. Stuart, I'd now like to invite Ross Greer to make his contribution. Thank you, convener. Um, I agree with a lot of, almost all of what colleagues have, have said before, so I won't simply repeat it all. Um, like every other uh, grouping, the Greens have criticisms of the European Union that I think they would be slightly different from some of the ones that you've heard already. Uh, we would have criticisms of, for example, the common fisheries policy, but coming from a, a different perspective. But f from the point of view of the Scottish Greens, our position is still that Scotland has not given its consent to leaving the European Union. Not only did we reject that in the referendum last year, we voted overwhelmingly to remain in the European Union, but Scotland, at the general election this month, rejected the current party of government, which went into the election with proposals for its hard Brexit. So Scotland's consent still hasn't been given to that. Now, this current UK government and its, its position on a hard Brexit, on leaving the, the single market and the customs union might not hold, as, as other members have already said. But this last year has been 
deeply unsatisfactory for us. We've consistently seen both the Scottish and the Welsh governments uh, ignored, have their, their concerns not being listened to. Um, there have been a number of notable examples. The Scottish Government's Minister for Europe highlights his frustration at finding out when Article 50 was to be activated by watching the BBC News, because he had not been informed by the UK Government. This is after very positive words from the UK Government about the involvement of the Scottish, Welsh and, when it reconvenes, Northern Irish uh, executives being involved in this process, but it's not been borne out in reality. Now, we believe that the UK has set itself on a course to leaving the European Union, but that the people of Scotland should have an opportunity to decide whether that is a course they want to continue to be on. The other option is to become an independent country with aspirations for Scottish European Union membership in its own right. We're frustrated that despite this parliament having voted for there to be a referendum on Scotland's independence, the UK government's position is to block that referendum. Constitutionally, they have the right to do so. It is a power uh, that lies with them. We would need the temporary devolution of the, the power to hold that. And their position is for Scotland not to have that choice, that, that self-determination at this point in time. Given that, and the position that we are currently in as part of a United Kingdom heading towards Brexit, like colleagues across almost every other party, um, we would see leaving the single market as being absolutely disastrous, as being very much driven by ideology, as colleagues have, have highlighted, an ideological obsession with immigration and ending freedom of movement in particular. But for Greens, obviously, it's not, we do not just look at this from an economic point of view. Our, our belief in the single market is not just about the economic benefit it brings, but our belief in freedom of movement in principle. Our belief in continuing to, to remain part of the European project is about the collective efforts to fight climate change, to regulate the financial industry, to promote peace in the development of democracy. We still believe in all of these things and we still want to be part of European efforts to enhance uh, all of this. But we are currently in a very challenging situation. We have a, a UK government that has now begun negotiations and simply has no idea what it's doing. On day one of the negotiations, the UK government's minister for leaving the European Union, our lead negotiator, conceded on the major points that he had been making over the last few months, over the last 18 months, both during the campaign when he was advocating for leaving and in his year as a minister. The UK government's negotiations are fueled, as I said, by ideology. That ideology is falling apart when it faces reality. And reality is hitting home very hard, I think, to the rest of Europe, certainly from when I've been speaking to my colleagues from the rest of Europe. The UK government looks weak at the moment. It looks like it does not have a clear understanding of what it's doing. It looks completely outclassed by the negotiators sitting on the other side of the table. That reflects very poorly on all of us. Uh, here, but it also presents us with very significant risks, and those risks go across Scotland's economy and society across the whole of the United Kingdom. We have very acute particular issues that have been recognised, for example, with Northern Ireland, where there's almost a, a perfect storm there to, to damage a lot of what has been built over recent years and decades. And from my colleagues there, certainly, I've heard a, a huge amount of concern because there is no Northern Irish Assembly at the moment. They struggle to advocate on behalf of the people they represent. The complicating factor uh, added to that situation in the last few weeks is the only two parties to have elected members of the UK Parliament from Northern Ireland are the Democratic Unionists who are currently negotiating with the Conservatives to give them a working majority and Sinn Féin who do not take their seats. So only one party from Northern Ireland that only represents one community is currently active in, in elected politics, essentially, and is negotiating with, with the UK government. So our colleagues there have huge concerns about, for example, what the impact of leaving the customs union will be on the border between the Republic of Ireland and the North. But they are unable to give effective voice to that because there is no Northern Irish Assembly for them to have meetings like this in. So it's, it's a very challenging situation and one which we struggle to see a, a way out of that is going to be anything but damage limitation at this point. Uh, thank you very much, Ross. Now that all our committee members have had the opportunity uh, to put their views, um, perhaps there would be members of the, um, uh, the co committee who would like to... Um, uh, yes. 
Can I ask you uh, one question? It has been very interesting to listen to you and that key issue that you are all, all driven about. But do you think it would be possible to, when uh, we see the results uh, of the ne negotiation uh, in two years, the, that it will be a new, a new referendum or voting uh, for uh, when, when we can see the results, uh, what will happen. It's ob obviously it has a huge impact on Scotland. Uh, but do you think that it would be possible? Well, that's uh, what the First Minister ha has, uh, has outlined. That um, There was a le an election last year in, in Scotland to the Scottish Parliament. Uh, my question is more uh, a new referendum, not only in Scotland oh, sorry. or right. in the yeah. whole... A UK in, referendum. Yeah. Um, sorry. Yes. <laughs> Well, I think as a number of members have said, and I know that there, Tavish may wish to say something about that because it's his party that have that particular policy position. Um, you know, the uh, Scottish government have said that they think that Scotland should have a choice and that should be through a referendum on independence. But on, because the situation is so fluid and because the UK government is so unstable, it is actually quite a difficult one to predict. Um, but I have, you know, I have heard it said, I think it was the Irish writer, uh, Fintan O'Toole, who was, when he was writing in the Irish Times, said that when he, Mrs May got her comeuppance in the general election because she presented 52% uh, uh, vote to leave as the overwhelming will of the people uh, to, for a hard Brexit, which it clearly wasn't. And the people uh, of the UK made that very clear in the general election result. I don't know if others want to come in. On that. <laughs> I, I, guess we, I guess we probably all want to have a brief word on that. Um, uh, I, I think the experience uh, that I think is reflected across Scotland and the UK is that referendums have been deeply divisive and uh, conducted in a circumstance where people are presented with information which is partial uh, and sometimes plainly misleading. Uh, I think what's most important is to change the direction of the negotiation so that we get something around which people can unite rather than simply another opportunity to divide. Jackson. I, I suppose I would say that the Conservative Party did not win the election in terms of its objectives of securing a larger majority of seats. It did win an additional two and a half million votes. Uh, Joan McAlpine's party, the Scottish National Party, lost half a million votes here in Scotland alone, one third of the vote that they previously had. So, uh, you know, it, it's very clear that the Prime Minister didn't secure her objectives, but by no means did, uh, did other parties triumph. Uh, there are 318 Conservative MPs. There are 12 who represent Tavish. So there are a balance in all of these arguments uh, as we go forward. My overwhelming view is that people in this country are very fed up because elections are meant to resolve things. We had a referendum in 2014 on independence. We're still talking about it. We had a general election in 2015. The government got a small majority, then sought to get a bigger one and ended up without one and has resolved nothing. We had a referendum on Europe in 2016, the outcome of which was that we would leave, but now we're unclear what actually any of that means. And what many people say to me is, I keep voting in things because I thought that would solve the problem, and I find all I've done is end up with another vote ahead of me because nobody knows what the vote I just had actually meant or represented. So I, my own sense is that there is no appetite for uh, another early vote on anything. Whether or not that is something which is tenable, I don't know events will dictate, but I don't think there's any popular will for it. it. It may come about at some point. I think it's very unlikely that there'll be another vote on Scottish independence in, in the lifetime of the Scottish Parliament, though. I didn't predict Donald Trump would become President of the United States, and nor did I predict uh, that the United Kingdom would vote to leave the European Union. So, frankly, I think the game of political punditry is, uh, sorry, the game of political uh, uh, um, guessing is, uh, as to what might happen is, is uh, fraught at the moment. I, I rather agree with Jackson's point. The country's absolutely fed up. But the, the, the flip side of that argument is that they've now got a government who don't actually quite know what they're going to do. So I think the chances, ironically, Jackson's quite right about the numbers in terms of who we all represent and who went up and who, who went down. That's factually, of course, accurate. 
Um, the, 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 the irony of the outcome of the, of the United Kingdom general election is I think there's more likelihood of, of actually whatever the deal is being put to the people because I can certainly see a scenario where the Tories stagger on, get through it, and then, and then are, are internally riven by contradictions over the outcome. It's not hard enough for some, it'll be too hard for the Ken Clarks of this world, um, and therefore their cop-out, because they were the ones who, who gave us this in the first place, and now it's all about them in that sense, will be to, uh, to put it to the people. So I, do, I think before the general election, while I may have made the case for it, I don't think there's any chance of it happening. Now, actually, ironically, I think there is a chance it might happen. Ross. Yes, thanks. Just uh, very briefly, there is a sound democratic argument for it happening. If you compare our two referendums, in 2014, uh, the Scottish Government proposed not just that Scotland become an independent country, but they proposed a white paper on that, which was a book on what independence would look like. And you can have profound criticisms of that, but there was a specific offer on the table. I, as someone who voted for independence, disagreed with a lot of what was in the white paper. It was still there. People could still scrutinize it. The referendum in 2016 had no such prospectus. Many people on the leave side were explicitly saying, of course we will not leave the single market. Of course we will not leave the customs union. Others were saying absolutely the opposite. So there was no clarity on what people were really voting for. So there is a sound democratic argument that at the end of the process, once we know what it actually is, not just this vague concept of leaving the European Union, but what that specifically means, there is a sound argument about putting that to the people. Like Tavish, I thought it was almost certainly not going to happen before this general election. I think it is now marginally more likely, but still unlikely. For us in Scotland, though, it doesn't necessarily solve all of those issues because you could have another referendum with exactly the same result of Scotland voting to remain in, but the UK as a whole approving the final deal and voting for Brexit. Now, for those of us who don't consider that to be democratically adequate, it doesn't, it doesn't resolve our issues. I think overall, it's, it's still unlikely that we will have a referendum on the deal, but there was almost no chance of it before, and our politics, as you might have noticed, is rather fluid and unstable. Richard Lockhead. Just to make the key point, of course, that in the referendum on independence in 2014, one of the key issues in the whole debate was that if you voted against Scottish independence, that was a guarantee to remain within Europe. So the Conservative Party made that argument and the, the no campaign. So quite clearly, in terms of Ross Greer's point, that the uh, premise in which people voted in 2014 turned out not to be the case. However, the point is that in terms of the national interests of Scotland and the views expressed by Scotland, that we need Europe to reach out to Scotland. We need all of you and your colleagues and your respective countries and parliaments and uh, chambers to reach out to Scotland because we have reached out to Europe and we are an outward looking country and in terms of our continuation in the single market and free movement of people, uh, these are very important national interests for Scotland. So clearly we are part of the United Kingdom uh, and that does complicate matters from Scotland's point of view. But given the history of Europe since the Second World War, where often the continent has adapted to a changing political environment and public opinion, our plea is that we need Europe support in 2017 to recognise the political environment and public opinion and what's best for solidarity and countries working together. Stuart McMillan. Thank you. Um, I thought it's an interesting question uh, and it took me back to uh, well, the, the, the phrase or the quote from uh, Harold Wilson, a week's a long time in politics, so the next 18 months is an eternity. Now, uh, nobody can predict uh, what's going to happen. Uh, within the next 18 months. Uh, I mean, I think Tavish's uh, point regarding uh, Donald Trump and the like, absolutely accurate. Uh, so anything can happen. Uh, I don't think the, the will of the population is there to have uh, another referendum. Uh, but at the same time, going back to the lack of clarity uh, in terms of the arguments to come out of the European Union, uh, when information comes out about uh, what's on the table, um, and then, then that will might that it might change, but I think also going back to Richard Lockhead's point regarding regarding Europe, 
And obviously, uh, with this process, obviously, a deal has to be ratified by the member states, uh, as well as within the UK. And that's where I think the European Union have got a very important role to play. Uh, in and the member states have got an important role to play in terms of uh, their thoughts and, and their uh, commentary on the deal that uh, ends up being offered uh, to, well, the UK and to the EU27. To come back on the, the democratic point around your question, something that hasn't really been raised, um, apart actually from Jackson and his opening comments, is the role of young people. Uh, many young people uh, did not vote uh, in the European referendum and then woke up the next morning horrified at, at the result. And uh, we had a session specifically for young people in our committee to, to give them a voice, which was very, very useful. Uh, and obviously one of the things that young people are most concerned about is their rights as EU citizens, which they had always taken for granted, that they, would, they were EU citizens and they could travel freely, study, work, set up businesses, and they feel that their citizens' rights has been taken away from them. What's been interesting at a UK level in the last election is that the big drive to register young people and many more young people voted in the UK general election uh, than voted um, in the, the referendum. Um, now at, at UK level it's um, uh, reasonable to say that many of them voted because of the, they were galvanised by Jeremy Corbyn, the leader of uh, the, the Labour Party and uh, although they possibly didn't know that um, the Labour Party's position was actually to leave the single market and to leave the customs union which is uh, exactly what they, they don't want to do but I mean it seems to me that if that process continues and that more young people want to right across the UK want to participate in the democratic process there will be pressure for them to have another uh, to have another vote and um, that's just my personal opinion. I think I should quickly add that it is not the Labour Party's policy to leave the customs union and we are certainly looking to maintain yeah, as many as possible of the benefits of the single market. So you can see that uh, <laughs> this, will be a, uh, this will be an ongoing discussion and uh, yeah. uh, a, change, a change of government at the UK would allow clarity immediately. Yeah. Oh, not sure about that, but yeah, um, uh, we, perhaps um, uh, are there any more questions? Otherwise you may wish a little bit of a break before I think you're attending First Minister's questions. Um, Mr. President, let, let me just uh, add one important aspect because we need as well a lot more facts and figures. Of course, EU is well prepared on the Brexit process, so that's what we know. Uh, but for us, we would like to get a bit more out, out of you, not necessarily now, but for the coming weeks and months, so about your exports. So most likely, most of that is if you if you take Scotland as such. So most likely, so your export is mainly with uh, England, but then uh, we, e, the rest of EU. So that's the that's the big market for all your industries, all your uh, export activities. And then if you you take uh, your uh, students in schools and so. They have dreamed that, okay, they can go to, to visit uh, other EU countries, study there. Uh, Erasmus has been a real uh, success, and we want to extend that kind of activities much more. So now, what is the, the, that future at the moment, or how that is seen? Uh, I've been working myself with the university level, and there... There, I was here several times some 15 years ago when we benchmarked the Finnish National Innovation System and yours. I visited several times Harriet Watt and the others, how we can increase our collaboration. So a lot of your researchers, I had to figure that one fourth of your research staff in your universities is from abroad. So definitely that is a strong interest. So. And they are all the aspects, so it would be nice to solve one, or one by one separately, but that's, that's not the reality. And what I've been worried, and we've been worried much so that our committee of the region, our interest is, and strongly is, on uh, tackling these migration issues, those, that kind of issues, but above all, 
sustainable growth. We need to get uh, the different funding instrument to operate more in synergy. And that's the reason why we have established, or the EU has established these strategic uh, investments where most of the money is coming from the private sector, but coming due to that we public sector, we are doing a lot of hard work catalyzing, enabling this uh, new development. We have and we will have the cohesion funding, which is more targeted, that's self as well on capacity building, on knowledge, on sustainable development. So uh, in synergy with the strategic investments and with private funding. So our major concern is to spend our time on that kind of things which come and create the progress and create the well-being for the citizens. And now this Brexit is, uh, is, is really taking a lot of time everywhere, most likely more your concerns on that kind of issue. And uh, we strongly believe that and, and we are working on so that we see Brexit now as an opportunity for the rest of EU to renew certain activities, maybe one third of the, uh, the points message is coming from UK. Uh, how do you want to change and what are the reasons why to leave? So they are the one third is the ones that we want to change as well. So we will change those. So EU will be more positive in the future, more target oriented, more towards this, uh, this uh, uh, global, stronger global role. And that means both for businesses, but for the people, for students, for everyone. And this is our concern as well. And this is what we would like to continue with you on this kind of development so that we get more of the very concrete uh, uh, issues, facts and figures included so that we can make this renewal process. Uh, but that helps you as well. And. Uh, hard Brexit, soft Brexit, or return back to the original place. Uh, it's about, uh, I think, I, I'm dreaming about a better Europe, a much stronger Europe, where the people get much more out of this. And I think that many of our key decision makers still have this and are, are, are working for this, uh, the positive future of Europe. And let's see then what is the final outcome of the whole Brexit process. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Um, I think the, your, your closing remarks there uh, absolutely summarise uh, much of the work that this committee has done over the last year. Uh, I think it's fair to say, and other members have said that in the vote last year, many people perhaps just didn't understand uh, the European Union and what it actually delivered uh, for people in this country. And I think some of the work that we have done over the last year uh, has uncovered exactly what the European Union uh, does for Scotland and how vital it is in all sorts of areas and the challenges uh, that Brexit presents. So it may well be helpful uh, to um, the Conference of Presidents if we perhaps sent you a summary of the work and those four reports that we have done uh, over the last year as well as the reports themselves that you could continue the work of, uh, of um, your Conference of Presidents uh, into um, the implications of the referendum for the European Union as a whole. Um, I would like to thank our guests for a very valuable and interesting discussion. Um, I understand you will now attend First Minister's questions and that we will then have the opportunity to continue more informal discussions over lunch and I very much look forward to that. Thank you very much.